Hi, uh, welcome to the afternoon session of uh, City Scripts 2021, day two. Our first session for the afternoon is a virtual uh, library walkthrough of the DOC1 Public Library, hosted by Marie Ostegard. Uh, the session will focus on the architecture of the building, how the library is used, and how the institution sits within the city. Now, Marie is the library director at the Aarhus Public Libraries. And since 2001, she has been part of the Aarhus Public Libraries' development of the physical library of the future, uh, focusing on interactions, user, uh, user involvement, network development, prototyping, and communication in the physical library space. Aarhus has investigated new technologies, involvement processes, and learning. In a wide range of projects and processes within users, network, and partners, she has focused on the development of the next library, the library of the future. From 2005, Marie was a project leader of the building of DOC1, implementing and developing these ideas, as well as introducing new forms of user and citizen involvement in the planning and building of DOC1. Marie is also part of INELI, which is the International Network of Emerging Library Innovators. Thank you so much for joining us, Marie. Uh, over to you now, please. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for this kind welcome. Um, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen and I'll get into uh, what I want to share with you guys today. Um, so here, if, if there is a, a light coming in, it's because it's still morning here in Denmark. Um, I know you're in the afternoon and uh, where some of you are at least. Um, so do you see my screen now? Yes, it's very clear. Excellent. So I'm just going to take it into full mode. So I, I decided to call this uh, presentation um, Public Participation as Democratic Infrastructure, because that's basically what I believe that libraries are. Um, but just for the few of you who might not know uh, a lot about Denmark, it's a very small country. It's uh, in the north of Europe. We only 5.5 million uh, inhabitants, so not, not so many people. Um, and we have 450 fixed library service points. Um, Aarhus is the second biggest city, um, and for us, that's 300,000 people. Um, it's a quite a young city. There's a lot of students. We have a big university here. Uh, so there's a lot of network, a lot of um, culture, a lot of startups uh, in the city. But also, as I go through this, um, bear in mind that um, the Danish society is quite um, digital. Uh, a lot of the... Um, all dealings with the uh, public um, organizations is done uh, uh, through the internet. Um, we do have a lot of connectivity across the country, a lot of cooperation across um, different institutions in, in Aarhus and in, in, this, in the country. So this is what the area looked like before we started building Doc one And, and as, um, as, as was said in the beginning, Doc one was also part of a whole city development project where uh, this is a, a picture of the harbor in Aarhus where you, that used to be all industry, but for a long time it had been just sitting there not being used for, for much basically, except for parking spaces. But, it, but being a prominent space just by the water, um, it, it became more and more clear for the city developers that this needed to be explored and we needed to find a way to make this accessible for everybody because being by the water is, is extremely um, um exciting and it's something that really adds value to a city center. We have a lot of waterfront in, in Aarhus, but this city center was, was key. So the city decided that they wanted to make sure that this inner center was not just for wealthy people or big condos being built or banks or whatever. Um, this needed to be a place for everyone. And so uh, we pushed quite heavily saying, well, there isn't any, any other organization that's for everyone than the library. So the library became uh, then the driver for um, for developing this area in a, a, perhaps in a lot more ways than we even believed in the beginning. So as you can see from the beginning, this was just, it was basically parking spaces, heavy traffic um, going on, but also some old buildings that were quite quite interesting to, to um, build next to. So what was planned then was to create a, a project that would be a hinge between the city and the water uh, with uh, opening up of the stream, which is um, what part of the what, what happens in Aarhus is there's a stream going through and a lot of cafes around that area. The building of Dock 1 um, and then the construction of two major harbour squares uh, north of Dock 1 to have that close access to the water. Um, and, and this is 
an overview scene from the other side of how it turned out, being a very clear passage for citizens to the water and, and clear access to the, the different opportunities that are there, and also a very democratic way of sharing the most, one of the most prominent spaces in the city. So the vision for Dot One was to create a space for cooperation, basically, um, and an open informal learning space. But also we needed, we knew that um, the, the city needed a special place for children and families where you could go on a Sunday afternoon when it, when it rains, which it does in Denmark quite a lot. So there's a big need for that. Um, and so we, we had a, a very strong uh, intent but we decided not to be very detailed in how the vision should care, be carried out because we knew that we were going to have to build for a long time. And this is a when you build a bu building like this, this is the biggest construction um, project ever in the city history. And when you do that, you build for 100 years, not just for 10 years. So we needed to have a vision that would go further. Um, so the way we look at it is that public libraries are really de um, democratic open buildings. It, they're basically like a square in the city, just with a roof on it. So this is a place where people come together across um, um, uh, educational background, political um, beliefs, uh, religious beliefs, age groups, et cetera, in a non-commercial space. And basically when we look at our society, that's the only place that does that. This is the only place where you have that diversity and you actually meet and is part of the same space. So we wanted to, in, to, um, to support that feeling, both in terms of architecture and in terms of the uh, content of, of this new space. It was basically a covered plaza. A, 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 city, a, a public library needs to be both a space, it needs to be a place, and it needs to be about relation. And this, this triangle is extremely important when we're dealing with how to develop what we want it to be this new library. Um, it's not very often that you get to build new libraries. Um, and when you do, it's it's sort of a uh, an opportunity to just push in all the different ideas and, and dreams that you had, because you know you might not ever get to build another library in your life. Fortunately, that's not true in terms of Aarhus, but, but um, that's a different story. Uh, so we wanted to, when we started this project, we, we knew that there was a lot of discussion going on. This was in, I think we began talking about it in the beginning of, of maybe 2000 and, and 2001. And, um, and we, at that time, there was a lot of discussion about whether, um, do we even need libraries? Nobody's going to borrow books anymore. Is, isn't a library just a place for books? Um, people will be online. We etc cetera, etc cetera. and so we decided to make sure that we focused on uh, what can only be experienced in the library so instead of looking at the library as a space for media we decided to look at the space as a media in itself which is a very big mind shift for us and instead of talking about this as a place where you meet information this is a place where we wanted to meet people um, so so it was a big shift from from um, a container of books and perhaps some um, communication of, of knowledge into people being the core issue of this place. And um, so, so we decided that also the, the whole process of doing this needed to focus on how we could co-create with the citizens of Aarhus and have them co-develop with us uh, in a very non-hierarchical way. It was a very difficult um, thing that we set up for ourselves, but we just knew that when you build, you build for you. It takes a long time, so we knew that things were going to change during the building time, and also we we wanted this to be heavily invested in the community needs, and the only way of being able to do that would be to include as many citizens and partners in in this process as possible. Basically, it was about us. We we didn't have enough knowledge to be able to do what was needed in Aarhus, um, and in order to create the best library possible library, we needed to gain knowledge from all different uh, kinds of um, places, both nationally, locally, and internationally. So we, we spent a lot of time doing that. Um, so basically we look at this as a mashup, as a big physical framework around a lot of different activities uh, not necessarily carried out by the library. We needed, we, we always known that we need to do this always when we do libraries, we need to always do it with partners and partners can be 
um, can be other organizations, institutions, and it can be citizens. But the whole point of everything that we do needs to be to create better and more diverse services for our users. So our strategy basically is to go and it was and it still is to continue to go from a place where the library has ownership, ownership of activities, ownership of the places and the spaces um, into a place where it's driven by partners. And I'll come back to driven by citizens as well. So we, the way we have approached this from the very beginning, this was actually even before we moved into Doc1. Doc1 opened in 2015. So now we've been running it for quite a while. but. Um, but even before we moved in, we decided we needed a very strong partnership strategy to achieve all this. Um, and so we work on three levels with partnerships on a strategic level, on a program based level and on a network based. And that means that every single member of the organization needs to be able to go out and do partnerships. And when I talk about partnerships, I'm not talking about funding. It's not about getting partners that can help fund stuff. Uh, we are funded by the municipality. So partnerships are always about services for citizens and it's about creating something together um, and and that means that we need to have an organization of staff that is empowered to go out and form these partnerships and make that cooperation um, so at the moment well right now we're actually closed down because of the COVID-19 but uh, when we're open <laughs> I have to say that um, we have around 140 programs a month and 50% of those are carried out by or with partners. So that's a pretty heavy load of that. And I think we're often discussing the balance. Do we want even more percent? And I think we might want to end up at a 60-40% um, share because what we see is that these partners, they bring in competences, knowledge, uh, ideas, and drive innovation in a way that we can't possibly do on our own. And it's that's really what benefits the citizens. We also see how this is a, a movement going on where the more you come into the library and you see um, maybe your neighbor doing something uh, in the library space, you think, okay, this is something I could do. Or what if my group of people who are super interested in plants, did a, did a program in the library for other people. And that's how we keep building on top of um, other good ideas is that people get inspired by seeing someone else doing something in these great public spaces. So we use programming as a strategic tool and we use it to, to, in, to strengthen the different aspects of um, the community that we think needs either help or needs someone to sh uh, shed a light on it. And we uh, use it to ensure that the diversity of our programming and of our uh, services is high enough um, for what that, this community needs. And this is not, doc, not just in DOC1. We have 19 libraries in Aarhus and DOC1 is the main library, but also the other 18 is the same approach um, that we do in all 19 libraries. So, and I'm not going to go through all these um, projects, but I just wanted to show you how also this uh, partnership and programming uh, um, strategy uh, helps us drive a lot of different development projects. These are just a, a, a some of some of them that we're doing, and all of these projects are done in partnerships either locally, nationally, or internationally. So we have um, cooperation with. Um, people from all over the world, from MIT in Boston, from the Baltic countries, Iceland, um, uh, Australia, et cetera. So, um, so that's how we continue to work on getting enough knowledge in for us to keep growing, because this is not just about building a great building. It's about continuous growth and, and development in our mindset about libraries. So the way with, that we've um, approached basically uh, everything that we did in the building process, but also are doing now after we open and after we're in the library is to work with user involvement and design thinking. That's the methods that we are applying to everything we do. So just like we want a lot of partnership driven activities, we also want the citizens to have the ownership of this building. Libraries are in its core um, 
owned by the citizens. That's how it should be. And, and I think um, maybe in history, libraries forgot that at some point. Um, and so we've reawakened that um, knowledge and making sure that also the citizens know that this is their spaces. So design thinking is an approach. It's an approach of, and a method for user involvement. It's a mindset and it's something that is that we do in order to get better services and solution and explore. Um, we've been using it throughout um, both the, um, the planning of Doc One, the uh, building process, and after the opening, we've turned this into a praxis that we are um, that we have in the way that we do libraries. Um, we were lucky to get. Um, Okay, I'll just I'll tell about this. This is just a, I'm not gonna, I don't expect you to be able to see this in details, but this is an, as, is an example of how even the, um, even the physical building, the blueprint of the building changed through the building process because of user involvement. So as you can see, it went through different phases where uh, on the top, this is, that's how it looked like coming from the architectural competition. And then it kept developing throughout the um, processes because of the user involvement that we were doing. Um, so I think that's a very strong um, proof to what, how important it is to do these uh, involvement processes. We were very lucky to, um, I think it was in 2000 and, 11 uh, to get uh, a, a big grant from the Bill and the Gates Foundation to create a, a design thinking toolkit for libraries. So together with the Chicago Public Libraries and a company called IDEO, we uh, then uh, developed this toolkit uh, for libraries and then um, we um, got supported from the uh, foundation to go out and train libraries all around the world in using design thinking as a, as a tool for developing services and approaching the communities. Um, and this has taken on a life of its own. Is that actually the toolkit has now been translated into, I think, 16 different languages by different countries because this is a tool that a lot of libraries want to use and it's always easier to do it in your own language. But we go out and we train um, other libraries across the world in using this because we truly believe that that is the way that. Uh, that is a way of ensuring that user involvement is at the core of what we do. Um, so we use it in Aarhus for prototyping, um, for developing also new libraries, uh, developing spaces, developing service. And we've now taken it into a process where we are doing design thinking programming as a service to citizens so that we train citizens in using it for solving their own issues. So it's come full circle in that sense. So very often, this is what our library looks like. It's a lot of people, a lot of mess, and a lot of building, and a lot of prototyping. And that's how we want it to be. And we want to have spaces for that. So basically, we've come from a place where citizens' involvement used to be very dull, super boring, just something that you had to do. That was the typical um, public approach to it, where it was just about informing the public and where we wanted it to go and have taken it to is to a place where we actually delegate power and we have partners with the citizens in um, developing the stuff that we do. So co-production and co-creation are key um, words for how we do libraries. The libraries is also um, a very strong factor in development of democracy. And, and when I talk about democracy, I'm not talking about uh, the act of voting. Of course, that's also a part of democracy. But for us, when we talk about democracy, it's really about participation and about being able to influence your own life and your own circumstances. And for that, libraries are a core institution because we we can be as a space, a community driver and a connector. So, um, so literacy in all its different forms, it can be health literacy, it can be media literacy, it can be language literacy, are all necessary for participation and for citizen empowerment. And that's what the libraries can provide. So 
we have different numbers, as I said. So in Norway, for instance, the, they actually wrote it into the library legislation that the library must be a democratic independent space for public meeting and debate. Unfortunately, we don't have that in our legislation, but that's how we do it. Um, and we try to push to change the legislation because we want that obligation in our legislation. Um, so, so when they're being, uh, as you guys know, um, all over the world, uh, democracy and the, um, our capability to talk to each other and share ideas and listen to someone who's not necessarily agreeing with us is under pressure. That's something that we see in, in countries all around the world and also in Denmark. And so we're having a lot of discussions uh, about what is it that a strong democracy needs? And, and coming out of a, from a lot of uh, different research being done, um, it's, it's been clear that democracy needs a participation culture in society. Uh, in our libraries, that's what we've been working with for decades now. Um, this is what lies behind the whole idea of the library as a community hub. And we know that literacy is key in order for, to have a self-confidence in being able to influence your, your community and your own life. So in that sense, the libraries can be an answer to how to, to strengthen the participation culture. We also know that facilitation of the conversation is important for people to feel um, um, capable of engaging. Um, in, in Denmark, there, every year there's done we have these uh, credibility research being done saying, so who's the most credible and trustworthy um, 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 institution? And where uh, politicians and journalists, they're, they're in the bottom three together with used car salesmen actually. Um, libraries are always ranking in the top three or four. Uh, so in that sense, there is a high level of trust amongst the broad community that if you go to the library, it will be um, an independent space and I can come and there is a facilitation of um, a conversation. We know that partnerships across the community is important for a strong democracy. That's what we're dealing with in, in our libraries. And we know that in order to have a strong democracy, we, a community needs inclusive spaces, spaces where you can meet, where you can talk, where you can participate. And libraries, all over the world, we have a democratic infrastructure of public libraries, of buildings, of physical buildings that can be used for this. Um, so I used to call this a democratic infrastructure that we have. And also in libraries, we have this very big diversity of people um, that we don't see in many other uh, institutions. So that's a, a gift to trying to create these uh, stronger participatory uh, democracies. So for us, that's a very key component. But obviously, um, and I'm gonna show you now a lot of different pictures because all of this is just words. And, and the important, what we find is that we can talk as much as we want, but if people can't see it in the physical space, it's not gonna work anyway. So we've tried to create both uh, architecture and uh, content and usage that always supports the things that I've just been sharing with you guys. So one of the things that we know is important is what we what I call unprogrammed spaces. Spaces that are not too uh, heavily decided upon. Spaces that are very flexible. Spaces where you can see coming in, this is something I could fill with activity. So the, the, the picture here shows uh, the very core of our library. It's a two-story library, but it's a very open two stores. Um, and this is the core, and this is a highly uh, flexible space. Always when you come in, different things are going to happen. It's really basically just a big staircase, but, and we can put up, um, I'll show you here, 500 people can sit, uh, sit there and having one speaker, or you can uh, have debates, but you can also have different activities on each level. So it becomes this very important center of different kinds of activities all coexisting at the same time in the middle so it has a very um, prominent space this is another place in the library where uh, in normal just usual um, default setting it would be filled with tables students sitting here uh, overviewing the water having a great um, um, 
just a, a being there, but it can easily be trans transformed into something that's happening. So we have tons of these spaces that can be reprogrammed into um, serving different needs and um, showing the different types of life that a library consists of. So we have tons of different ways of um, coding the, you could say the physical spaces. We're doing, um, when you do um, support startups, homework, contemplation is also, this is not a silent library. I just want to say that, and, and you probably already guessed that. And that's very much on purpose. So there is a place that is silent. We have a reading room. If you want silence, that's where you go. Um, and you can stay there for all, all day. You don't have to read. You just have to be silent. Because sometimes as, a pe as people, we need silence. But other times, we need something else. And the library needs to be able to, we need, the physical spaces need to be able to support different human needs. And, and so that you can always find a place that supports what it is that you're looking for at the moment. If you're looking for a debate, you should always be able to find one. If you're looking for somewhere to just meet someone else, that's also something we should provide. Um, we use our um, media service surfaces. We have tons of screens in the building. Um, we use them so that citizens can leave their own mark. So it means if you're um, if you're hashtagging Doc One on Instagram, put up a picture hashtag Doc One, it pops up on the screens in the library. So it means that we get the users to tell us what they experience and what they saw and what they've been doing. And and luckily everybody wants to post nice pictures of food and kids and someone being happy. So we have tons of happy happy pictures all around the building coming from our users and from our community. Um, we want this to be uh, the, the library to have the sound of people. That's So we try to take all the different activities out in the open spaces because we want people to stumble upon something. We want them to stumble upon something that they didn't know existed or they didn't think they could find at the library or that they have never thought about. And we want them to think, hey, maybe I could do something like this. And I'll give you an example. The the choir in the in the left corner, it was um, it was just something we stumbled upon. This was a great place to have choir. We have a lot of choirs, uh, amateur choirs in Aarhus. A lot of people sing, and that suddenly boomed into an explosion of choirs approaching us, saying, "Hey, we want to also uh, sing in Doc One." And so, and, and all of a sudden we were overflood by choirs wanting to sing Doc One. So we decided, okay, we're gonna turn this into a regular service. So every Saturday morning, there is, this is choir time. So we have five choirs every Saturday coming, um, performing in Doc One. And they bring all their friends and all their families um, that, and some of them might not usually use the library. So we bring them in and use that network to keep strengthening um, the usage of Doc One. So it's a way of, of how some snowballs just keep running. We have a lot of user-driven activities. Um, uh, so the, the picture in the left corner is, uh, is our father's toddlers group. So we, in Denmark, we have, um, um, we have paternity leave and uh, this group of fathers came For kids, also for adults, and of course, obviously, play uh, makes noises, and we want that. We want to explore the uh, the importance of play in terms of culture, in terms of learning, but also play in its own right. Um, so, a lot of places in Dog One is um, heavily focusing on this. And finally, I just want to show you uh, one of our art pieces in um, in the building. In, in Denmark, there is a, a rule that you have to spend 1% of the construction money on, on art, which is amazing. Uh, and we wanted something that was interactive and would bring people together. And so this is the, the big thing in the middle here is a big gong made out of bronze. And it's, uh, it's, actually, it's actually the world's largest tubular bill. We didn't know that, but... but um, before we built it, but uh, but it is it's, it's by a Danish um, artist called Christina Robstorff. 
And the point is that it's linked to the maternity ward in Aarhus, where everybody gives birth. Um, so when you give birth at the maternity ward in Aarhus, there is a big bill, a big button you can push. And when you push it, it gives a gong in the library. So that means when this gong sounds, people who know the story, they will look up and they'll just think, just pause for a little second about, okay, somebody just had a baby or, oh, I remember when I, I had my baby or somebody just experienced something wonderful in their life. And even if they don't know the, the meaning of this gong that they hear, they still raise their, their eyes and they just look around and look at the other people in the, in the room and just connect for a small second and then go back to what they were doing. So in that sense, the art also brings us together in a stronger way than it, we could have done otherwise. And it's beautiful, I love it. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. So basically, summing up, Dark One, we believe is a democratic space. It's created uh, for, by and with citizens. It's always about engagement and about experimenting and keep keeping moving forward um, to create better spaces. It's a place where we interact uh, and it's a place where you can do your own things and keep building on your own competences. Right, so that is what I wanted to um, share with you in terms of um, slides. And you're very welcome to um, contact me on email and there you can check out some more pictures on um, on our website. So I'm just going to stop sharing now and see if I can see you guys. Right. Yep. So what I think was supposed to happen now is that uh, if you have questions, you're very welcome to um, ask them, but maybe one of the um, coordinators can take over here. Hi, Marie. Sorry, could you just uh, repeat that, please? We missed that a little bit. Excuse me? Could you just repeat that again, please? What you just right. said? Yeah, no, I was just asking if one of you would take over for question and answers or we should how we should go forward. Oh, yeah. So we have a few questions coming in. I can actually just read them out uh, to you. So we have somebody who's asking about what the initial budget for the library was and uh, what's the kind of budget that the municipality, which I guess would be the city, uh, city specific government that assigns to a library like this. I think we're just getting, getting us, we'd like to get a sense of how involved the government is in right. the building of the library. Right. So all public libraries are funded by the municipality, not the not the national government. Uh, and it's through tax money. So everything we do is financed by uh, citizens' tax pay, uh, payments. Um, the initial budget for the library, uh, well, I'll just have to calculate if you're um, going to try to do it into dollars. It was around, so that would be, 1 billion Danish. Um, well, I, I can say that the, the annual budget for um, the library, the 19 libraries in total is um, seven, 7 million, no wait, $10 million, that would be. And, and it's not, we don't have them designated to either doc one or the other, that's the annual budget that I have. Um, and it would be, okay, I'll answer, I'll answer another question. I'll come back to the initial budget. I'm not sure it makes much sense though, because what's all, also part of that budget is a big uh, underground parking space um, with, uh, an it's an automatic parking space with elevators for the cars. So that's also part of the budget. We never took those things, um, out of the budgets. So all of this is linked together because it was all part of the same project. Right. Uh, Priyanka Shankar would like to know uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about the sustainable practices that you have in the library. Right. So when we talk about sustainability, we, we 
take the broad approach. So sustainability can be about climate, but it can also be about um, social sustainability, and it can be about um, 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 gender sustainability. It can, it can be about a lot of different types of sustainability. But if you're asking about the the um, sustainability in terms of environment, uh, we do a lot of different things. So we um, actually, we for two years, we've had a very target on um, the um, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, the UN uh, goals, the SDGs, and trying to work on both ch changing our own practices so that we as, as an institution and organization become more sustainable in everything that we do in terms of garbage, in terms of uh, driving, in terms of the materials that we're using, but also to be this hub for citizens and other actors of the community who want to engage into activities that will change the, uh, the sustainability in a good way. So we also set up a lot of different kinds of activities that um, makes people, um, you could say, be more sustainable literate uh, and link up with each other in terms of if they want to go together and work together. So we actually constructed, and I didn't show you any pictures of this, a whole area of the library that has these big um, pictograms from the Sustainable Development Goals on it. And this is where we've created a special hub for the SDGs. This is also where we try from that to spread out to all the libraries working on the other types of sustainability. So where we're working with specifically, we just did, um, a great um, program with uh, homeless people, uh, so where that where they would be the ones t sharing their stories uh, and um, being uh, an equal part of the library community. We have a lot of homeless people in the library uh, usually, and and they um, and they just interact with everybody else. Uh, so people don't necessarily um, know that they're homeless. We do because we know them and they come every day but it's they're just part of the life in, in, in the library. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Elsa and she'd like to know how many languages are represented in the library? Uh, that depends on what the question means. Is that how many languages do we speak or how many languages are represented uh, in the I think in the, collection. Collection. in the collection. I have no idea. Tons. <laughs> um, so every, uh, I actually don't, I don't even know the answers to that. We have uh, tons of different li uh, uh, languages in the library and it's always, as we have libraries in 19 different place, uh, places, we try to um, adjust the collection so that if we have a large, I don't know, Vietnamese population in one area, that's where we have a lot of our Vietnamese um, um, books, etc. But we have a, a whole range of um, uh, international languages. I see uh, something in the chat, a lot of glass and the external yes. structure of the building. Uh, no, the glass doesn't help heating, actually. Um, the the glass, so on the contrary, <laughs> the glass, heats it up a little too much. So that's actually the, the, the whole construction of the roof is done so that uh, light doesn't hit the, uh, the glass uh, constructions uh, directly so that it doesn't heat up too much. But the, the, the glass structure is really, I think might be a very um, Nordic thing because we live in a quite cold country. We, and we are in very heavy need of light. Uh, so, and it's not too warm, so we can we can have these big glass structures. But basically, it's about being able to feeling like we are outside, even though we're inside, because the weather is not very particularly well. So when you're standing inside and you have this huge glass structure, like four four and a half meter high glass facade, and you're overlooking the water, you can imagine how what an amazing feeling that is, even if it's raining or snowing outside, that you're still part of the outside. So it's a very much an intent of the bridging between the outside and the inside, and the city and the water. Oh, I see someone was an exchange student in Aarhus. Awesome. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, we have a lot of students and, and we have a, and, and the good thing is we have a lot of um, also um, international students and a lot of them come to Doc One because that's if they come on their own and they maybe want to get out of their small um, the places where they live, this is where they can go and they meet a lot of other people. So we have a lot of participants um, uh, from all our programming that are international as well. And we do quite a lot of English spoken programming as well in order to include the large international community that we have. Great. Um, I, it doesn't look like we have uh, uh, any more questions. So, uh, oh, sorry, we do have another question. We, somebody would like to, Amrit Raj, who also he works with us. He's in the IHS library. He'd like to know if we offer any remote services, uh, if you're at the doc one. And what would that remote services, what, what are, um, I'm presuming because of the pandemic. So if you offer oh, right. Right. outside of the library itself. Oh, tons. So, so in, in usual, in normal days, I would say we have remote services in our jail. We have, um, we, we deliver um, um, book bags for uh, some pe people who aren't able to, for some health reason, aren't able to go to the library. We deliver that once a month. Uh, we do a lot of libraries outside the library. So we have different, uh, we have a book mobi mobile, we have a tuk-tuk uh, a that we take out um, to different places in cities. Um, we do, we, it's a, it's a strong intent to go out of our own buildings and work with others in other parts of the city. That's part of the, the whole um, community hub idea. Uh, right now, during all the, the lockdowns and the working from home, we've, we are heavily engaging in digital services. So we have tons of digital services. As I said in the beginning, Denmark is a very digital country. So it's, uh, it hasn't been too hard for us to have people engaging. So that will be everything from um, uh, knitting clubs going online, um, presentations by authors, or uh, maker space activities, uh, being streamed and, and online reading circles online. Um, we are also doing some sustainable um, sustainability activities online, trying to get people to talk together because that's one of the things that we um, that we see during this pandemic is that people are feeling isolated, they're feeling lonely, um, and so we try to create digital services that will create digital communities uh, and. Of course, we will build upon that in the physical spaces as well um, when we get, when we get to return. We have another question, but from an anonymous attendee who'd like to know how the pandemic has changed people's view of the library, and uh, if you notice any changes in visitor footfall. I'm, um, if you're still open, actually, I knew that a bunch of countries were going into lockdown again. So have, are you back up? We're not back up yet. We were uh, into our second lockdown in mid, from mid-December. And right now, actually on Monday, we're opening just a little bit uh, with where people can come and pick up reserved um, books. So they, they, they reserve stuff online and they can come and pick that up. They can't browse the, the buildings. They can't stay in the buildings. We can't do programming. So I think that is a very good question about how, how it changed the people's view. One of the things that we saw after the first lockdown, when we reopened, was that people felt safe going to the library. They felt that this is a place where they could go, even though there is still um, uh, a COVID in, the, in society. Uh, we also saw that some of our um, users didn't come back. Some of the, the elderly people felt in general, of course, worried about moving into society again because they were, uh, it was dangerous for them. Um, we saw that um, obviously nobody wants to be part of a, a program that has a hundred people. Um, but so we move, we changed our approach to programming into working heavily on more relational uh, activities. So we're, we were investigating how can we create smaller relational activities that will create community feeling um, because nobody had the, wanted to be in part in these big groups. And um, I think 
an interesting thing also happened that even though I, we know that half, maybe 50% of the people who come to the libraries, they don't borrow stuff. They come to use the building, they go to programming, they come to meet each other or just hang out. But what we found was during this pandemic is that the need for literature and knowledge just grew and grew. So we had a, have had a very, very big push from citizens towards politicians to open up libraries and keep them open um, throughout this. Uh, so that's, a, that's been a quite an interesting change, I think. People all of a sudden realized that they missed the library. We're always there. You don't know you miss it before it's not there. That's very true. Uh, I think that's all the questions that we have. Marie, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a really wonderful experience. I think we've all learned a lot and we're excited for you to open the library and hopefully we'll be able to visit it uh, once all the madness dies down in the world. Yes, we're really urging to. <laughs> we want to we, we wanna open all over the world. Well, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be with you guys. And you have a, this, this is a wonderful program that you're doing. I know you're doing um, later with uh, Hannah-Laura Fogt from the Cologne Library. She's also doing one. Yes, which is we're doing also that. Also amazing. Yeah. Yes. That's a, she's a very good colleague and it's an amazing library. So look, you can look forward to that one. Yeah, we are. I think we're just glad. I think the one thing that has, you know, given us like this pandemic has allowed us to reach out to you and Hannah Lohr and we can, you know, we can see these libraries that are like halfway across the world for us. So I think it's going to, you know, encourage all of us to kind of get out and visit these whenever we can. So, but it's a very good point that, and we've seen that too, that, that this, this pandemic has done something good in terms of us being more better at reaching out to each other and sharing and exchanging ideas internationally without being able to travel. So that's that's a very good outcome of it, at least. So we seem to have one last question, sorry, before we leave you. Uh, uh, we'd like to know, uh, an, again, an anonymous attendee would like to know, what do you see as the greatest role libraries have in strengthening democracy? Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. And I think, as I as I as I said during my presentation, I think that this is probably one of the most important aspects that we need to focus on in libraries um, now. Be not just because of the pandemic, but the pandemic actually pushed it even further. If we don't take that role as libraries, I don't know who will. I think our key issue is to create these spaces where you where you um, have insights and where you learn something and you learn something about yourself, but you're also exposed to things that you don't necessarily agree with. We know how we all work in, and live in our little bubbles where we, we talk to friends that agree with us. We see the same stuff on Twitter. We see the, so we follow the ones that we agree with. There is no, not, not many places where you get exposed to other ideas that you disagree with because you can just shut it out. That we need to be the bridge builder. We need to help build the bridges between the different um, groups in society and create, and, and create uh, an atmosphere and a space where that can be done in a safe and independent way. I think that's probably the short, short, shorter answer to that question. Um, yes. It's a very important okay. discussion, I think. Yes, I think you're... Absolutely right. And yeah, we hope to see that these, I think, even spaces, you know, in places like India for them to transform into these spaces. I mean, we have a way to go, but uh, I think they're good goals to achieve. Yes. For all of us. Most uh, thank you again, Marie. Uh, we hope to see you in our other sessions. And of course, that you will come join us again, either for city scripts or something else that we plan to do at IHS. I would love to. Thank you so much for inviting me. And take Thank care. You. Yes, you too. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Uh, so as you may know, uh, we've been running a haiku contest at uh, City Scripts. Uh, this is basically as part of our library walk. So we'll be announcing the winners for after each of the library walks that we do. That'll be at 3 p.m. every day till Sunday. So the winning entry for today is by Sable Pradhan, who's a student at uh, Jyoti Nivas College. So congratulations, Sable. 
Um, we'll be starting our next session at 4.15, which is the world premiere for What Makes a Home by the Danish Cultural Institute. So you can either just stay logged in or you can log in again at 4.15. So we'll see you then.